Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Al Jazeera goes all in on the U.S. market, spending big money to bring its brand of journalism to Americans. Will it work? The last time we checked, Jon Stewart and his gang had their doubts. Whoa, 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 whoa. News hour? China, censorship, and the battle in Guangzhou. And life in exile for one of Sri Lanka's best-known journalists. Why is she running scared? This week, we're turning our lens on ourselves. We're looking at Al Jazeera's recent takeover of the American cable channel, Current TV. It came at a reported price of half a billion dollars, and Al Jazeera is hoping that this deal will help it crack the media market in the United States. There is still some stigma attached to the Al Jazeera brand in the U.S., the residue of what the network called the aggressive hostility of the Bush administration. And changing attitudes in the White House have yet to trickle down to U.S. cable television companies. Cable operators are key middlemen in the American media business, and the major ones have all refused Al Jazeera's efforts to get its signal out. Al Jazeera did not buy Current for its studios or its equipment. It wanted to inherit Current's existing cable deals and a distribution network that reaches 41 million American homes. Is Al Jazeera getting value for its money? What kind of journalism can it offer? And are Americans interested? Our starting point this week is Washington, D.C. <laughs> Al Jazeera acquiring current TV gives Al Jazeera an added dimension. This is what they've been trying to achieve for a long, long time. This is just a natural step towards being a global media conglomerate. The biggest problem Al Jazeera has had is a lack of understanding about what the network really is. Al Jazeera does not exist in a vacuum. It has always existed in parallel with American politics. Two, one. Hello there, welcome to the program. Al Jazeera is wagering a reported $500 million that in this political environment in the U.S., now is the time to make its move. Al Jazeera tried to do that back in 2006 when it launched its English language news channel, but it was effectively locked out by the cable television companies that hold the keys to the American broadcast kingdom. I represented Al Jazeera in 2005 and 2006 when it initially launched. It was a particularly hostile environment and the cable operators generally backed away from it because there were misperceptions about what the network really was. Over the years, there's been a recognition that there's a widespread um, uh, demand among viewers for the network. What the cable distributors had said for many years was they did not believe that Al Jazeera's business model made sense for distribution. In other words, people wouldn't watch it. I would say there was like a, an official sanction against Al Jazeera. These companies were making business decisions, but, but I believe those business decisions were made in the context of a lot of politics surrounding what Al Jazeera represents. There is an unconscious sense uh, or resistance toward global uh, counterflows of information, that is, information and news coming from the South and being produced uh, uh, by the global South. And of course, one cannot ignore the political dimension, meaning the perception of Al Jazeera in the United States. It did struggle to get distribution. Uh, there have been a couple attempts. Ultimately, a channel that had good coverage across the country became available, and it seemed a natural way to get immediate access to 41 million homes across the United States. And, you know, from my perspective, uh, for the help it'll give us in news coverage, it's worth it. Al Jazeera is still fighting perceptions created during the Bush administration in the post 9 11 era. We know that Al Jazeera has a pattern of playing propaganda over and over and over again. The administration vilified the network. The U.S. military, by accident or design, struck Al Jazeera bureaus in Baghdad and Kabul and also imprisoned network cameraman Sami al Hajj for six years at Guantanamo Bay. What few remember, though, is what preceded that, the praise that U.S. officials lauded on Al Jazeera after the 1996 launch of its Arabic news channel as a welcome force for freedom of expression in the Arab world. The U.S. government supported Al Jazeera when it launched in 1996. But this all changed at 9-11 when Al Jazeera broadcast the notorious Bin Laden tapes. And from that moment on, there was serious problems between the U.S. government and Al Jazeera. 
And really relations only started to improve when the US pulled out of Iraq and when the Al Jazeera cameraman was released from Guantanamo Bay just a few years ago. The Arab Spring caught everybody's attention. It's unprecedented for people to march to the streets this way. Al Jazeera covered it very well. Al Jazeera won awards for its coverage. Al Jazeera won the praise of officials in the United States government. The viewership of Al Jazeera is going up in the United States because it's real news. Whereas in the past, members of the previous administration had made very disparaging remarks about the network. Al Jazeera plans to create a new channel for the U.S. called Al Jazeera America. Al Jazeera English will continue to be seen in other markets. The American channel still faces challenges on the distribution side. One cable company, Time Warner, says it had been considering dropping Current TV. After the sale of Current to Al Jazeera, Time Warner immediately announced it was dropping the channel. The next day, after the company was criticized for its decision by the New York Times, among others, Time Warner said it would keep an open mind on carrying Al Jazeera. Time Warner Cable uh, essentially ended their contract with Current TV a few hours after Al Jazeera said that they had bought Current Television. They didn't even give Al Jazeera a chance. It wasn't like it was going to cost Time Warner Cable any more money. So I think there's economics, but there's also politics involved with Al Jazeera's struggles. Up until now, most Americans watching Al Jazeera have done so online, streaming the channel live. Once Al Jazeera America goes on cable, that channel's live stream will not be universally available in the U.S. The cable companies want American eyeballs to be watching their signals and often structure contracts accordingly. Other Al Jazeera news channels will be available in the U.S. via live streaming. The broadcaster appears to be betting on more conventional technology, that getting on cable in America will give it a real bang for its half a billion bucks. It's going to be a game changer for the rest of the news business, I think, that as people begin to see the quality coverage that Al Jazeera provides, I think that there will be an increased interest in international news overall. I think it's going to actually up the game for all the networks. It's going to change the new news business the way that CNN did in the 80s. Al Jazeera will face uh, stiff uh, resistance in the United States because its point of view is not acceptable to many Americans. And I'm particularly thinking of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In recent years, the channel's status has improved in the United States a lot, but it's not the end of the road for Al Jazeera in terms of the challenges they're going to face in the United States. I think the biggest challenge for Al Jazeera is um, losing its alternative edge. And this is a problem that comes up precisely because Al Jazeera would be moving from the periphery to the center, so to speak. So what happens when, when you move from the periphery to, to the center? What happens when you compete head to head with mainstream media players? Is there a risk of Al Jazeera being domesticated, so to speak? Would it lose its creative uh, edge? Would it lose its alternative uh, spirit, so to speak? Those are the real questions, I suppose. Our Global Village Voice is now on Al Jazeera and America. Democracy depends on a well-informed citizenry, and we become better informed by obtaining information from a diversity of viewpoints. But currently, American media is controlled by just a few large corporations, and this inevitably limits the type of information we receive. I predict that the most heated criticism of Al Jazeera is going to come from people who don't actually watch it. I go to Al Jazeera English's website all the time because it's a great resource on areas such as the Balkans, Africa, regions that are underreported and just don't get a lot of attention here in the U.S. press. So I really think Al Jazeera can fill a void and that there's a need for good international news reporting. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Last year, we told you about Southern Weekly, a newspaper that's been testing the journalistic bounds in China. In its latest standoff with the authorities, it appears to have come out on top. Journalists at the Guangzhou-based publication went on strike and staged a rare public protest against censorship after a row broke out over their New Year's editorial. The original article called for more political reform and a move towards a constitutional government 
but it was changed without the editorial team's knowledge to a version wholly uncritical of the ruling Communist Party. The story went big on Sina Weibo, China's Twitter-like microblogging site. The dispute forced provincial party chief Hu Chunhua to step in, and authorities agreed to loosen some of their editorial control. Journalists have now returned to work, and the latest edition of the paper has hit the newsstands. Last year, we took a long look at the battle for media freedom in Hungary and how one radio station in particular found itself under threat from the government. Turns out that that station can keep broadcasting. Club Radio was one of few media outlets in Hungary to critically examine the policies of the Conservative Prime Minister Viktor Orban. It was then threatened with the loss of its license. Club has just won a court ruling that says the authorities must allow the station to broadcast on the frequency of 92.9 FM. Club was up against the Media Council. That's a body that was formed and appointed by the Orban government. The government set up the council in 2010 as part of a controversial overhaul of the media sector in Hungary that has attracted strong criticism from both the EU and the US. A postscript now to last week's show in which we focused on whistleblowers in Barack Obama's America. Later this month, ex-CIA operative John Kiriakou is scheduled to be sentenced to two and a half years in prison for releasing the name of a covert CIA officer to a freelance reporter. That reporter, Matthew Cole, never identified the officer who played a significant part in America's extraordinary rendition program, which involved capturing suspects during the so-called War on Terror and sending them to prisons in third countries where they were often abused. The Obama administration has already charged twice as many whistleblowers, six, for the alleged mishandling of classified information under the Espionage Act than all past presidential administrations combined. One of the things that we've noticed from our online numbers is that whenever we do a story on the media in Sri Lanka, we get a lot of hits, principally from Sri Lankans. There's an appetite for information on the island because over the past few years, freedom of the press has been under attack by the government there. One newspaper in particular has been in the governmental crosshairs, the Sunday Leader. Back in 2009, its editor was threatened with death over his journalism, then shot and killed. And his successor, having been threatened herself, has recently fled the country. We'll be speaking with Frederica Jans in a minute, but first, a bit more background on the state of play in the Sri Lankan media. When the Sunday Leader's editor, Lasantha Wickramatunga, was shot and killed on the streets of Colombo in 2009, he saw it coming. We know that because before his death, he wrote an editorial on his own death, published posthumously in his newspaper, in which he blamed his killing on the government of President Mahinda Rajapaksa. In that article, he predicted no one would ever be charged with his murder, and no one was. Wickramatunga's successor, Frederica Jans, had her own run-ins with the government, including an extraordinary clash with the president's brother, Sri Lanka's defense minister. Jans says the minister threatened her over the phone and said there were a lot of people in Sri Lanka who wanted to see her killed. She then published a transcript of the call. A few months later, the Sunday leader had brand new owners with close ties to the government, and Frederica Jans says she was fired. She has since fled the country and has made an asylum claim. Jan says she does not want her location revealed for security reasons. She spoke to the Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi. Frederica Jans, welcome to the Listening Post. Um, we understand you don't want people to know where you are, but can you tell us what made you leave Sri Lanka? You know, you'd been receiving threats throughout your four years as editor of The Sunday Leader, but what changed in September? What made you leave? I finally made the decision to leave after I was told by my lawyers that uh, my passport was to be impounded and um, that there was a very real possibility that I was looking at a jail term very soon. Even after my services were terminated as editor-in-chief of the Sunday Leader, I was followed home twice by men on motorbikes. I received a threatening phone call where the caller spoke in the vernacular in Sinhalese and threatened me with death, saying that if I continued to take on the defense secretary, Gotabi Rajapaksa, that I would be killed, uh, that he was considered a hero in Sri Lanka because he had successfully ended the war. And, you know, in, in the backdrop of all that had happened to me, particularly involving a story and a, and a transcript of a conversation that I had published involving the Defense Secretary, I was told, and I actually began to finally believe it, 
that my life was very seriously under threat. So yes, so I made up my mind, I have young children, that my uh, sons need a mum and not a heroine. Speaking about your relationship with uh, the defense minister, that phone transcript, that conversation that you published in the Sunday Leader, you were basically calling him to follow up on a story that you were investigating. And in the course of that conversation, he threatened you. Is that typical? Is that how the defense minister, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, is that how he talks with all journalists? Is that, is that the kind of interaction he has? This has been one of the worst cases where he abused me in yes, absolutely foul language and, and said that if he and I were at a public function together, that 90% of the people there would want to see me dead, would want to kill me, he actually said. Now, having said that, um, this kind of behavior by the defense secretary is not unique to me only. Uh, he has previously threatened journalists in Sri Lanka, including foreign journalists. You know, in September last year, just after you had published that transcript of that conversation, an investor named Asanga Seneviratne, he bought a majority stake in the Sunday Leader. And then the paper was made to publish an apology to the Defense Minister Gotabaya Rajapaksa for making that conversation public. This is despite the fact that you had evidence, you had the tapes to show that the conversation occurred. Asanga Seneviratne was pushed, I would say, that the sale was accelerated following my having published a transcript of that conversation. And he was given orders that I clearly had to go, that the lady had to go. So no sooner Asanga took over, two days later, he fabricated or a, he got a presidential confidant to fabricate charges against me. A police entry was made and um, I stood my ground. I refused to resign and I actually told Mr. Seneviratan that he could sack me if he wished to do so, which he did do. The Sunday leader had a reputation for taking on the president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, for taking him on, for taking on his government. Talk to us about the sorts of issues you were covering. What stories were you reporting that other news outlets in Sri Lanka weren't doing? Well, for example, post-war, one story that comes to mind immediately is a story I carried on the front page in 2011, where I said that a foreign government, namely China, had given a grant to the president as much as nine million US dollars. It is the first time ever, I think, in the whole history of Sri Lanka that a foreign government has given a head of state uh, such huge sums of money to be used at their discretion. And we ran this story, we had proof. The president went absolutely berserk. He called the chairman of the Sunday leader, Lal Vikramatunga. He screamed at him and threatened him too. Two days later, posters were printed, you know, calling the Sunday leader and its journalists, traitors. And these posters came up all over outside the office. So yes, so that is, that is one instance. But as a result, we, we paid a price, we always have. The civil war in Sri Lanka lasted 25 years. And especially during the last couple of years, that final push towards the end, journalists, the media came under a lot of pressure. For example, journalists were not allowed to go into the war zone. They were monitored. Many of them were kicked out. Was that a turning point for Sri Lankan media? Or you know, would you describe this as a more slow and steady slide in the government's tolerance towards uh, reporting that it does not like? It was definitely a slow and steady slide. Since the end of the war in May 2009, there has been a very definite take over or state control of all media outlets, and that includes independently or privately owned media. The Sunday Leader actually is a classic example of what happened. Similarly, the government continued its attack on journalists post-war. One case that comes to mind is the news editor of the Jaffna-based Udayan Tamil newspaper, where its news editor, Mr. Kuhanadan, was brutally attacked in 2011. Uh, men with iron rods attacked him and he almost died. In the 2010, another journalist, Pragit Eknaligoda, went missing. He is yet to be found. So the level of intimidation, the harassment has continued. They have continued to call journalists traitors. Um, Lawyers appearing for me and the Sunday leader were termed or called terrorists or, and traitors. I mean, you have the chairman of the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation who goes on air every morning. He has a show that he speaks on. He has character assassinated me, for example, day after day on that show. 
the split between the Sinhalese and the Tamils in Sri Lanka has defined the country for so many decades now. Is that divide reflected in the media landscape? For example, in, in the post-war Sri Lanka, how have Tamil media outlets, how have Tamil journalists fared? They have fared very badly. There is a well-publicized case of J.S. Thissanayagam, Thissa, as he was affectionately known. Thissa was arrested by members of the Terrorism Investigation Division, the TID in Sri Lanka in 2008. He was sentenced to 20 years rigorous imprisonment in 2009 for having just published two editorials in a, a quarterly magazine that he published uh, which focused on issues in the North and East and human rights issues. Um, Tissa was subsequently granted a presidential pardon two years into serving his sentence only because of intense international pressure that was brought on the government. But Tissa has left the country and lives in exile, as do 30 or more other journalists who have left Sri Lanka since the conclusion of the war. Ten years ago, if I had told you that two editors from the same paper would become victims of Sri Lanka's media crackdown. You know, your predecessor, uh, Lasantha Vikramatunga, he was shot down, now you are in exile. Would you have believed that it was possible? No. Where Lasantha was concerned, there was always a very real danger that he could be killed, that he could be murdered. As far as I was concerned, because I was on the newspaper and, and serving as one of its main investigative reporters, I also was victim to many death threats, both written and verbal over the telephone. I was also hauled up before the courts in politically motivated cases. But having said that, it never ever, I never dreamt that I would one day actually have to flee Sri Lanka and live in exile. That, that is something that I never envisaged. And if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have, I would have just said never. I would never leave. Frederica Jans, thank you very much for speaking with The Listening Post. Finally, we've never given a web video of the week a rerun before. However, recent news developments have given this one fresh relevance, so here goes. Back in 2006, when Al Jazeera English launched as a news channel, among the people who took a look at us was The Daily Show, Jon Stewart's program on Comedy Central in the U.S. One of its correspondents, Samantha Bee, spent some time at our Washington bureau and assessed Al Jazeera's prospects of developing an American audience. She also offered us a little advice. We ran some of this piece back then, and with Al Jazeera making another push into the U.S. market, we thought this would be an appropriate time to dust it off and take a second look. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Al Jazeera. The Arab language news network has swept the Middle East, and they've got plenty of fans over here. What Al Jazeera is doing is vicious, inaccurate, and inexcusable. So it's no surprise that they've launched a new English language network. Hello again, the top story on Al Jazeera. But how many people are watching here in the U.S.? Al Jazeera. <laughs> U.S. cable companies have refused to carry the new network. We're looking to produce a, a journalistically quality product. Aren't you trying to appeal to an American audience? <laughs> it was clear that Johnny Prep School didn't know the first thing about the news game. So I studied their programming. You're such an expert on the worlds of terror and spies and spies. Oh my God, he is so old. If you don't like the angle on a story, you can report it your way. Oh no, this just makes it go slower. <laughs> American and Chinese companies in providing a search engine. Yeah. If they were going to succeed in American television, I'd have to become their Al Jahiro. So I took a look under the hood. Where are all your graphics? We usually put graphics at the end of the news hour. Whoa, 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 whoa. News hour? And that music ain't helping either. What's that the sound of? People working in an office. What's gonna happen in the world today? Oh no, something terrible. Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera.